Hi everyone, and welcome to my lecture on depth of field, or DOF. My name is Trish Triampho Sullivan, and I'm here to talk to you about how, uh, about the three things that affect depth of field on your camera. So let's get started. So only three things. Effect depth of field. And they're pretty straightforward. The number one thing is the aperture on your camera. Remember, the aperture is like the window. It's, um, it, uh, it's basically like your eye, right? It's like the pupil of your eye. So the number one thing that affects depth of field is aperture. So <clears throat> the, this is something, you guys make sure you take notes on this, okay? Um, the larger the aperture, the narrower the depth of field. The second thing that affects, uh, that affects depth of field is the distance of the photographer to subject. The closer the, the closer that you are, or the photographer is to the subject, so the closer you are, the narrower the depth of field. The third thing that affects depth of field is the length of the lens, so that's called the focal length. So the, the third thing is the length of your lens, or lens size. And that's normally called the focal length. So all focal length means is how long the lens is, okay? so. The length of the lens is the third thing that affects depth of field, okay? Now, the longer the lens, the narrower the depth of field. Those are the only three things that affect depth of field. <clears throat> your aperture, which is your main control in your camera that affects depth of field, okay? The, um, the larger the aperture, so the bigger the aperture is, the larger your window, the narrower the depth of field. The opposite is true. Smaller, <clears throat> the smaller your aperture is, okay, if it's really tiny, I, the wider or deeper depth of field that you're going to get, okay? Um, the second thing, distance to your subject. So the distance of the photographer to the subject just basically means how close you are to your subject. So the closer you are to your subject, if I'm here with my camera and my subject's right here, it's going to be a very narrow depth of field. <clears throat> and then finally, the length of the lens, the focal length of the lens, which means how long the lens is. So <clears throat> the longer the lens, the narrow the depth of field, right? So if you have a short lens, like let's say a wide angle lens, um, which is pretty much the kind of lens you have on your cell phone camera, right? Or a point and shoot. So the longer the lens, the narrower the depth of field, okay? Shorter lens, wider depth of field or more area in your photograph is gonna be in focus, right? So the same thing is true. The further away you get from your subject, 
right? The wider the depth of field. So the opposite here again, <clears throat> the smaller the aperture, larger depth of field, larger, bigger aperture, narrower depth of field. So that's it, it's pretty simple. Only three things affect depth of field. So why is that important? Why is it important to know about the depth of field? <clears throat> well, as we talked about earlier, when I, when I gave you guys the lecture on, um, on a little bit on depth of field and how the aperture works and how, it, how like seeing like a camera, right? How we need to be able to see like a camera um, or think, know how the camera works properly so that we can take better photographs. Um, so the, what is important because there are times when you really need to have, um, when you need to have the background or the foreground blurred out in your picture, right? So when you're taking a photograph and let's say I see my, um, let's say I see my, uh, my little niece and she's just so adorable. She's playing in the park. She's got her beautiful little dress on and she's just great. I want to take this photograph, right? But the background is full of ugly trash dumpsters with the F-bomb written all over them and stuff. And I don't really want that to show in the background, right, with my beautiful little niece. So I want to blur out the background. So to do that, the first thing I do is I'm going to set my aperture. I'm going to set my aperture at the largest depth of field. So, um, uh, uh, or set my aperture at the largest, which would normally be probably an f2 right around that area like all cameras are different so you'll notice that you may have different aperture sizes that i'm writing on the board um, because different cameras and different lenses are all a little bit different okay so if this is my camera here and here's my beautiful little niece she's playing you know some ways away i'm not going to try to make um, make her look and real, really real here. Um, and in the background, there's this, all this ugly dumpsters with, you know, all kinds of bad graffiti on it. So I want to narrow my depth of field. So the first thing I do is I put a large aperture, right? And usually that will allow me to just have this amount of my photograph in focus. Okay. Now that's important if you want the viewer to focus on your subject, right? If there's a lot of distractions in the background or even the foreground, it's pretty hard to focus on your sub on the subject for the viewer if they're not really sure what the subject is. Maybe maybe I was taking a photograph of the dumpsters with the graffiti, right? I mean, who knows? So um, so if I just want this part, I want to use a very large aperture, which is a small f number. Okay. Um, so this area that's in focus, right, um, this is your depth of field. Okay. Now the depth of field can be wide too, right? But when we're looking for a narrow depth of field, another time that you might want to blur out um, part of your, your depth of field there, right, is let's say you're at a sports game and or some kind of an event where the audience is separated from the action by a chain link fence. That's pretty common and it's usually for the safety of the, of the viewers, say like in a NASCAR race or something, you've, you've got this fence separating you from what's happening down in the, in the track or on the field, right? Um, but you wanna take a photo of the field, what's happening out there, but you don't want that fence in the way. Well, this is where a narrow depth of field, right? is so important because you can you can set your cam your aperture um, at say f2 or, or f1 or whatever you have on your camera um, very large and that will enable you to blur out that fence that might be distracting in your photograph right so you can actually narrow it down pretty narrow so you blur out the foreground and the background now that said um, you can also make create a very wide depth of field if you want to with your aperture, okay? Um, the wide depth of field, let's say here's my camera here, and here's my beautiful little niece, 
And in the background, there's these gorgeous mountains and we're in the park where it's just beautiful. And I want to have a very wide depth of field. Well, you can get a depth of field that goes pretty much from just in front of your camera out to what we call infinity, right? Very far away. So you can usually, and you, sometimes you'll see this mark on your camera, the infinity mark, right? Which means that you can have a very wide depth of field but everything from just in front of your camera all the way out to infinity is in focus, in sharp focus, right? So to do that, you'd want a very small aperture. So you want an aperture probably F22 or F32 if you have that on your, on your camera, on your, on your lens, your camera for your aperture. So that would be a small aperture right, will create a very wide or deep depth of field. Right, so let's talk a little bit more about depth of field and then we'll move on to the demonstration. So the area of your photograph is in focus, and we'll write depth of field up here just so we know we're still working on this, okay? Um, let's say I'm photographing a person here. Okay, so when you're focusing, there's a, always a little bit of area in between um, your camera and what they call the first plane of focus. So we'll, we'll say that this is our depth of field. We're gonna have a narrow depth of field because I'm photographing a person, I'm doing a portrait, right? So right here, this area here between the brackets is our depth of field. This is a narrow depth of field. So there's always gonna be a little bit of an area in front of your camera. And you've probably experienced this on your cell phone where you've tried to get really close to something and it just won't focus. That area <clears throat> is an area that, um, that just will never be in focus. And um, I gotta think of the name of it, so I'll come back to that. So here we've got um, our depth of field and this where, where, where focus begins on your depth of field is this is called the first plane of focus. Okay, that's where focus begins. On um, the back area, the last part that's in focus is called your last plane of focus. Okay. Now, um, if you're focusing on, on something, there's always going to be, a, there's going to be a center of focus. So the center of focus is right here, right? This is the center of focus. And let me just write that in there. So this here is the center of focus. Depth of field extends one third in front of the center of focus and two thirds behind the center of focus. Okay, one third in front, two thirds behind. All right, so here we have the center of focus and the depth of field is gonna extend, depth of field extends one third in front of the center of focus and two thirds behind the center of focus. 
And this area that never can get in focus, it's just too close to the, to the front of the lens, is called the hyperfocal distance. Okay, you'll probably never need to use this, but it's good to know about it. It's good to know that there's an area in front of your camera you just can't get into focus, right? It makes a lot of sense. So depth of field is very important in photographs, and I want you guys to really practice. I want you to find your aperture on your camera, and I want you to try changing it and see what happens, okay? Um, on a point and shoot camera, you may have to go to your scene selection or your icons, okay? So with your icons on a point and shoot or even sometimes a crossover camera, you may have to use your icons to control your aperture. Now, just because you don't have the manual controls of shutter speed and aperture on a point and shoot or a crossover camera, you, th that does not mean that there aren't, they aren't there. You just have to know where to find them and how to use them. So point and shoot cameras, you would normally need to use your icons. So when I say icon, right, I'm talking about the little pictures that they often use. And so you'll see a picture like this. Right? That's macro. And that basically means extreme close up. Okay. So you also might see like a, a silhouette like a, or a person like, like this, right? Right. That is portrait. And normally portrait will give you an, a more narrow depth of field, right? It's going to help you with that. Um, you also see this icon, right? Or this one, okay. which means landscape or far away, which is wide depth of field. Okay. okay, so a macro would be a narrow depth of field, very narrow, okay. A portrait would be kind of semi-narrow, right? It's not going to be completely narrow depth of field. Okay. And a landscape would be a very wide depth of field, right, or a lot of your photograph is in focus, like from looking from the front of the camera to out into infinity, basically, okay? Um, so this is very important. You're going to need to know your icons if you have a point and shoot camera um, or even maybe a crossover for this next assignment that helps you practice depth of field. And the reason that we do these, you guys, um, normally I do these in class. So if we were sitting in a classroom today, um, I would be giving you this lecture and then we would actually go out and do the assignment right after getting the lecture, right? Um, unfortunately, we're not able to do that right now. So we're in a spot where we have to be learning online and I'm going to do the best I can to help you. Um, but I want you to think of it like this. I could lecture you guys all day long on how to ride a bicycle, right? Um, you could read a book about how to ride a bicycle. Uh, and we could have a book with chapters, right? Each step by step, parts of the bicycle, right? How the bicycle works. Um, and I could tell you, first you put the bicycle upright and you hold onto the handlebars. Then you straddle the bicycle, okay? You put one foot onto one pedal and you push. While you're pushing, you need to lift your other foot up and put it on the other pedal and push with that one. And all this time you need to stay balanced so you don't fall over and you know go splat on the concrete, right? Um, now, does that really teach you how to ride a bike? No. The only way you're gonna to learn to ride a bike is by getting on the bike and doing it, right? And once you learn, you never forget, right? I could get on a bike right now and know how to ride it, even though I haven't ridden a bike in years. Okay, so this is a really important thing to think about. When we're practicing with our camera for these first three assignments, 
okay? This is you riding your camera. You're learning to work your camera. So these first three assignments are incredibly important. Um, and that's why I'm trying to give the best instruction that I can. Um, but you have to do your part. You have to actually take your camera, look at the controls, go through the menus, find out where everything's at, explore your camera, right? Explore it and learn it so that you can ride your camera to success in this class, right? We'll talk to you soon.